All right. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, we'll just have to. Yeah, we'll maybe you can go visit that. your uh, Austrian mountain. I hope so. <laughs> I mean, I, I yeah, it's, it's today that the uh, that the borders have opened again. So as of today, I would be allowed to travel again. Good. I'm glad to hear it. So, uh, <laughs> oh God, when was the first time we met? Was it Finland or was it Paris? Wow, that's a hard question. Um, if I remember the year, it would be easier to place it, actually. <laughs> it was a while say, ago. Yeah, it was a while ago. Oh, was it in Krakow in Poland? Um, or before that? It was before that. It was before that. Honestly, uh, you, you, I, I'm going to be sitting here and it'll go through my head. It, it might have been in San Francisco at an open world. Or open world, yeah. That could be 2014? Maybe. Maybe I was at open world in 2014. Because I, somehow it would fit more into, into the mental like planning that I, or, or the recollection of my planning in those years that I had in my head. Oh. Hmm. Yeah. Oh God. We yeah. You to, know how it is. Age. Yeah. I, I, I sit there and I, you know, it, I, I maybe have two people that I remember where I actually met them. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me guess your wife. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't tell her that <laughs> no i won't <laughs> usually it, it, there was some event that happened that stuck yeah, in my that's, memory that that's norm normally that helps normally that helps but yeah so i got a question for you yes what sure. got you interested in it and analytics and where did you go to school Three questions at once. Hmm. Mm. Um, what got me interested in IT first? Um, I basically started out like so many of us. Uh, basically, my first experiences around PC were when my dad brought the first home computer for his own use, which obviously we then kind of occupied as soon he, as he was away <laughs> with <laughs> all the usual, you know, <clears throat> showing my age here, the text-based adventures and so on that we had back in the days mm -hmm. uh, or even ASCII character stuff. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, uh, analytics that mm -hmm. more, that's more specific. That was during, basically during my studies, uh, kind of mixing things here, but, so I, I did a business master in, uh, um, in university and kind of three quarters of the way through during my, uh, well, in that university obligatory practical semester, I realized that pure management wasn't really my thing. Right. And um, I was in a project where I had quite some exposition to the whole let's say back end of the business meaning both ERP and CRM mm -hmm. and from there I made the logical step with my thesis going into data warehousing and that's kind of where uh, I really found where my interests lie uh, because it was literally making sense out of all the information that's being gathered in a corporation. Right. And I found that a bit more interesting than just, you know, using stuff as in using a CRM or an ERP system and, and uh, hammering in information and uh, doing shipments and, 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 and so on and so on. 
Interesting enough, I then spent a couple of years doing uh, exclusively CRM development and project management <laughs> <laughs> before finally coming back to uh, actual analytics uh, that, I, that I never had given up, but that just had taken second row. Yeah. So, and where did I go to university? I went to university in Austria. Okay. I went through, uh, well, what's what now more institutionalized and more properly called a University of Applied Sciences. Okay. Uh, when I went there, it was a, uh, let's say, test run of the university, as in, you know, hammering out the curriculum, finding out how much can we expect of these people, et cetera, et cetera. So it was quite uh, uh, an interesting phase because the... Uh, the university changed with us and around us while we were doing it. Mm -hmm. And what I liked about it, and what I still say, basically got me through university in, in uh, well, as fast a time as I did, was it's not a university where you can just, you know, show up and do whatever you want, uh, whenever you want. Right. Don't know, don't know how it is exactly with American students, but at least in, in Central Europe, <laughs> Austria, um, there's a lot of people uh, hanging around at universities at like 35, 40 years and they're eternal students. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, this was definitely not my thing because uh, if we failed one semester, we would have been kicked out. So oh, okay. uh, it, it, was, it was good to have the, to have the pressure to, to finish everything on time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, the, uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, it, you have to give somebody a deadline. <laughs> if they don't have very a deadline, yeah, very definitely. they never yeah. finish. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. What, now, um, when you went from university into working and CRM, warehousing, analytics, this whole span. What are some of your biggest challenges that you have faced? Uh, it may sound weird, but uh, basically age. Age? <laughs> yeah, I finished university at 21. Okay. Uh, so, um, and then I got headhunted uh, by, by a Swiss bank uh, to, to join their team and Basically, I joined the bank at, at, uh, at 21, well, 22, because I had to wait for my working permission yes. that we still had to get back then. Um, and so I joined them at 22 as a development team leader for uh, warehousing and afterwards CRM, which was kind of a hard thing because except one person, everybody in my team was older than me. Right, right. So... And now this young whippersnapper fresh out of university is coming <laughs> in and going to tell us what to do. <laughs> yeah, basically, basically. That's, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I have the advantage now of a lot of gray. <laughs> That's the reason why I crop my hair quite shortly, so the gray doesn't show that much. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> <laughs> otherwise it is, it is, quite, uh, it is quite silver. Well, you know, the silver will actually get you a little more respect, I think, at least initially. <laughs> yeah. And me, I, I am proud of every one of my gray hairs. <laughs> I want to display them. Well, it shows what we've been through. Yes. Yeah. That's the thing. It, it, it's like the scars of life. You know, they tell a story. Oh, yeah. And I've got and every gray of hair. Tells well, not a story as in I had a fist fight or something, but okay, this was this project, and the, the second centimeter up that was that project, and uh, yeah, yeah, let's see. Uh, I can honestly say I think this one here <laughs> was a project with somebody who thought he knew everything. Yeah, but then I can just point to my head. <laughs> <laughs> <It's> like. <laughs> There's, there's always that one person, always. Oh, yes. Sometimes they're more vocal, sometimes they're more um, like uh, hidden, but they're, they're always there. They're always there. Uh, I've learned a long time ago that uh, 
if you just listen to them, treat them with respect, and never tell them, but ask them. You know, if you yeah. tell somebody something, those defenses go right up. But if you start asking clever questions, you get them to think. That's, that's actually funny because that's one of the things that um, uh, a good friend of mine uh, told me, like literally when, when I started in that, in that bank, uh, this, um, uh, you know, not being a, an obnoxious question talker because that's the other extreme, but mm -hmm. um, more asking, as you said, these reflective questions. You know, think about it. If we do this, wouldn't the outcome be A, B, C? And then mm -hmm. as you said, it starts. It starts a thought process. It starts. Uh, uh, it starts to work in 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 the head of people. So they they're going like, actually. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah. Question. Ask asking questions and and especially you know leading questions with implications and and so on and so on. That's is is a very good uh, um, strategy for handling hard people on projects. Yeah, yeah, and and sometimes those questions have been asked of me because I thought I had figured it out, and somebody a little smarter than me, you know, directed those questions, and then I go, oh, light bulb comes on. Exactly, yeah. exactly. I mean, and I love it when 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 people challenge stuff that I do or that I design or so on, because as you said, it makes you think about things, and then. Also, sometimes they ask you stuff about um, well, either very specific things that you couldn't know about before, and you're like, hmm, okay, in that specific case, it means something very different. But oftentimes, and I have to say, uh, I realized this after, well, almost 20 years in the industry now, um, you can keep as open a mind as you want mm -hmm. at some point you start assuming things implicitly for yourself. Yes. And then when somebody asks a question that to them may seem either blindingly obvious or, 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 or stupid, and which is kind of weird because there are no stupid questions. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you go, yeah, actually you're right because I was basing that on an assumption, which in your case isn't true. So, I, I like that, especially when I'm doing uh, when I'm doing presentations and and talks at conferences, when sometimes people are hesitant to ask questions. Oh yeah. Um, and uh, the thing is, we we actually found um, in in the whole uh, let's say web based part of of events that we're doing now. For example, I mean today we're running uh, the Aces at Home uh, event again for so today and the next two days. And what we found is this this uh, this hesitance to ask questions mm -hmm. for participants in a talk is mm -hmm. far more easily overcome in web based events when you have a chat interface and the q and a interface where they can ask questions it's far easier for them to ask questions because you know it's not face to face the other people don't see you etc cetera, etc cetera. all the things that hinder you from you know going that step and asking out loud and which is really cool because we had really a case where a lot of interesting questions came up where we were sitting there and going like that's a good point that's a oh. really good point mm -hmm. and and then and then you can go in and you know elaborate and and the whole q and a becomes much more interactive right so right. funny enough, this is one of the very positive points that we found out about doing uh, events online. On the other hand, of course, you're missing the whole, you know, person to person interaction. Right. So there's no people sticking around after your talk and coming up to you uh, to, to the front and, and, and talking to you about their specific problem or, or whatnot. That obviously is missing, but you get more and the, especially a broader variety of general questions from the public. Right. And that, uh, <clears throat> and that makes you sharper. I know a lot of the things that I have added into presentations came from questions where I said, oh, well, I don't know. I have to look that up. 
True. It 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 makes it makes for uh, really good additional slides when when you when you then uh, you know modify the talk or give it again sometimes and then you add a slide saying by the way mm -hmm. this was a live question that I that asked one and then and then you can elaborate on that and then it makes things far more real because yes. it's not just theoretical stuff or okay I did this on a project and they're like yeah, yeah you did this but what about actual companies doing it. And then they're like, no, 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 these are clients that asked me this, or these are clients that brought this in. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm always very, very happy when there's, when there's interaction and when there's uh, feedback coming back, or, or even more use cases or so on. It, uh, it, it makes things more vivid. Yes, it does. It does. Uh, now, I do. Miss, one of the things I miss about the live interaction is the, is the after the talk, you're out and you're just generally talking to people mm -hmm. and you meet the people who aren't going to type a question mm -hmm. there and you find them incredibly interesting and you learn from them yeah yeah it's uh, we're, we're we're all we're all really keen on going back to doing things in person yes we're really looking forward to that yeah so am i so am I. So if you were talking to somebody just getting out of university or a couple of years before getting out of university and they wanted to follow in your footsteps, you know, say live in Switzerland, ski in the Alps or, <laughs> oh yeah. And also be an analytics guru. What advice would you give them? Wow, again, again, many, many different questions. Um, first of all, maybe don't choose Switzerland. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, sim simply, simply because there's, there's so many different places where you can do cool things and cool projects and, and have cool employers mm -hmm. nowadays. Uh, I mean, yeah, as I said, I'm doing this since 20 years now. The world has changed a lot since 20 years. Oh, it has. So there's, uh, there's many new interesting countries that have popped up on the, let's say, employment map. Okay. Where it can go. Um, and yeah, Switzerland is very central and everything. But mm -hmm. if you're young, I mean, I've, I'm, I'm still doing it a lot. Not right now, obviously, since, uh, as I just said before, the borders only opened today. Mm -hmm. But um, don't choose just one country to start with. Travel. Okay. Try out different ones. Mm -hmm. Try out, in, and especially try out also, you know, countries with very different cultures. Don't just go from... I don't know. Don't don't just go from 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 Germany to 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 Holland, or don't just go from uh, Denmark to to Sweden, or so. Just across the bridge. Right. Go somewhere outside of your comfort zone. Go somewhere mm -hmm. where they speak a different language. Yeah. Go somewhere where people have you know to boot a completely different mindset. Mm -hmm. I mean, for example, for somebody rather northern European, rather Germanic. Go to one of the Latin countries where oh. they're not as structured, where they, <laughs> where the, let's say, appreciation of time isn't really the same, where five minutes late in Germany is kind of like, Jesus, five minutes late already. Mm -hmm. Go to a Latin country where two hours late is just like, oh, I'm still here. Yeah. I, I got here. <laughs> yeah. All right. No. Yeah, I, I have friends that it's, you, you tell them, you know, be at my house at three o'clock, we're going to have beer and, you know, crabs, and they show up seven, eight o'clock at night, and, <laughs> and I'm like going, okay, you made it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now, so, so really, I mean, go out, experience different stuff. Mm -hmm. um, there's there's much to do and also just in terms of analytics um, there are there are so many facets to this industry yeah uh, try out different ones try out different vendors try out different um, let's say types of employment mm -hmm. don't just say okay I'm gonna be a consultant all the time right. I mean I started as as, as an intern mm -hmm. so, uh, not intern as an internal resource so uh, I was an employee somewhere 
and then I went consulting. Uh, and in consulting, I had different roles. So, you know, just the guy doing the work, uh, just as well as uh, leading a project or architecting a solution or, or building up an infrastructure. So basically not touching code at all. So broaden your horizon. Um, find out stuff. You know, if, if you're working in a company or, or in a project when you're, when you're a consultant, when you're working with, with um, a certain tool set or so, dig in, dig deeper, ask the question why. Don't just say, okay, I learned this, I'm gonna go to the client, I have a requirements list of 15 uh, points, I'm gonna go point one, two, three, four, but okay, why should we do this? And why should we do it like this? And why should we use you know, this methodology methodology to implement it. Why shouldn't we use something else? Do we have to use code? Do we have to use this kind of code? I mean, always question everything. I, I know I spent, I spent uh, the first couple of years literally coming home and reading documentations and reading and reading white papers on stuff and, and just basically finding out things because I wanted to know how things work so that then afterwards I'm able to challenge people also that, that come to me with questions. So basically the, my, my, my business counterparts in those projects, when they came with their questions about, you know, um, it, it basically was a, a lot about direct marketing and, and marketing analytics. Mm -hmm. So when they had questions on their campaign management or wanted new features in their campaign management that I could go back and challenge uh, and say, okay, listen, but if you want to achieve, I don't know, a higher rate of return, you know, just implementing this functionality basically won't bring you much or do you have, you know, numbers that prove it where you say, okay, we need this feature because we know it will increase X, Y, Z. So learn, question, and especially, and that's the most important thing for me, comprehend. Yes. Don't just do stuff. Don't just do stuff because it says somewhere. And especially don't just go and say, okay, we have a list of top 10 things to do or best practices and uh, we're going to do those without any reflection or whatever. We're just going to implement it. Uh, next client, we're going to implement it again. Next client, we're going to implement it again. No, you have good practices and uh, these good practices are always good practices in a certain context. Correct. Because trust me, I can take any best practice and give you a real life example where this best practice is just completely absurd because it doesn't fit that use case, that client, that specific uh, type of situation. So yeah, and especially if you come out of university and you start working, trust me, you know nothing. <laughs> you, you, may, you may have, uh, as, as one of my, my, my professors put it, what we're giving you is basically a toolbox. Yes. A toolbox with which you can then arrive at a job and apply this to your job and use it to actually do that job. We don't give you the like uh, ultimate solution and the answer to everything, which is 42, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, we just give you a toolbox. And then in the first part job or the first part of your job, depending on how long you stay, you may need three tools right. and then you may need a fourth mm -hmm. and then you realize actually I need to learn a new tool and add this to my toolbox and then you switch job or you switch role in the company and then you need different tools out of your toolbox you add others again so coming out of university and thinking you know something is well not true <laughs> you've learned how to learn exactly and I think this is the most important thing learning how to learn if you if you just go out and say well either i know everything or b i know uh where to look and that will be the solution both aren't really uh the ways to go yeah they uh it, it and you can wind up embarrassing yourself yes yes and <laughs> and trust me that that's uh I, i've learned to deal with it and i'm i'm 
pretty much okay with it nowadays to embarrass myself. I mean, I do presentations for crying out loud. So oh. yeah, I'm definitely <laughs> embarrassing myself continuously. Uh, but when I got out of university, that was one of my biggest fears, you know, not appearing competent and not, you know, competent enough for the job and, and, and embarrassing myself, uh, which is why I kept learning, kept reading, kept studying new stuff uh, on my own. And, and that's the other thing. Don't wait until somebody asks you to learn something. Mm -hmm. If you've worked on a, on, a, on a specific problem in your project and you've solved it, yay, you solved it, yes. But maybe then take three steps back and think, okay, how do we, did we get to this point? How did the problem arise? How did I solve it? And why did I solve it in that way? So do this reflection. Mm -hmm. I always like to go back and reflect on, on the solutions. Also, now that I design at clients, once they're done, to take a step back and say, all right, is this something that, well, first of all, can be generalized. This is something that could be good to write down and remember for the clients and basically propose when we have a similar situation saying, listen, we did this once, could this apply to you? And the mm -hmm. other thing is obviously, you know, is this the optimal solution? Mm -hmm. Could I do something differently? Could I do something more, uh, more optimal? Could I use a uh, different technology, a different tool set, uh, or even down to different coding? Mm -hmm. um, a lot of things, obviously in analytics, it, it, it's got to do with, uh, with, with performance, you know, when we're, when we're analyzing gigabytes and gigabytes of data with a single query, you start thinking about performance quite a bit. Yes. Yes, and uh, uh, it's always it's always uh, especially when it touches end clients. It's always important to end clients because you may be sitting there coding something or or, or developing a data model, and then you run a query against it, and then you wait, and then it takes twenty seconds, and it comes back, and you're like, yeah, was, the result set looks correct. But put yourself also into the shoe of the other guy, and that's this reflection part. You know, if I was the end user sitting in front of my screen, doing my daily work, and then I quickly need to look something up for, I don't know, you know, managing the, the, the um, my, my sales team, are they actually achieving their numbers this month? Mm -hmm. And then you quickly go into your analytics and you check the dashboard for your sales reps for this month for your product lines. And okay, and 20 seconds all of a sudden becomes very long. Yes. Because I log in, I go there, I see the result. No, I don't see them. Oh, I have to wait. So reflect on that. You know, is it really uh, a well thought solution in terms mm -hmm. of the, the person who is using it? Right. right. Is the user experience. Uh, yeah, what is the user experience? Exactly. And one thing I've learned, actually, I learned this the hard way is that 20 seconds adds up really quick and all you have to do is make a, a user sit there and wait a few times. They start getting irritated. They stop using it. They start yes. complaining. This, yes, they stop using it. And that's, I think that's the worst that can happen to, to anything we build. Right. If people don't use it, then, you know, why did we build it? Right. The, right. And, and, but in terms of the of the organization for for which you've built it, they've wasted that money. Exactly. It could have been used for something that's more beneficial to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's and that's also the other thing. That's one of the reasons why um, you know, apart from from um, you know coding and doing projects and, and on, I, I started quite early to also go into training. So not just keeping me trained continuously, but but giving training, right? Uh, first, just with the business users and, and the the uh, let's say stakeholder of the projects I worked with, but but then uh, I went and uh, became a teacher for at the time Siebel University and then Oracle University afterwards, mm -hmm. teaching both CRM and analytics, mm -hmm. and getting people from both the business side and the IT side to 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 understand the stuff that they're working with better and, and work together better to actually have both of them in many cases sit in the meeting that they have this kind of discussions, like you just said, you know? Uh, yeah, but think about it. You know, you programmer guy over there, 
if I sit on the, in front of the screen 20 seconds doing nothing, then I could be doing something else. And programmer guy is like, oh yeah, right. I hadn't thought about it like this because my day job is to sit in front of the screen and look at code and produce code. Right. You actually have something else to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> we, we all have other things to do along with our regular jobs. Uh, I spend a great deal of time uh, just holding the customer's hand, that's what I call it, you know, and walking them through a difficult thing, which helps me help the customer when I understand what their pain is. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's um, understanding the pain. So basically, for me, it, it all comes down to root cause analysis. Mm -hmm. You know, keep asking why, keep asking why, keep asking why. And I mean, the Japanese say after the seventh time you ask why, you arrive, you arrive at the core of the problem. Okay. Uh, which, is, which, is kind of, which is kind of true because a lot of times um, when, you, when you are in projects and you get requirements list or you get a, um, an RFP, and the RFP is written in a way that, you know, your spidey sense is going like, uh, mm -hmm. watch out, there's something weird. Um, I prefer to ask why one time too often than one time not enough. Right. And okay, why do you need this? What's the actual goal that you need to achieve? Exactly. Uh, what's the business need behind it? What's your pain point that you're trying to alleviate? Mm -hmm. is, it, is it something... You know, do you just want to better yourself in an area or do you actually have something that's a showstopper in your business processes, which is much worse because you can always ameliorate yourself, obviously. Mm -hmm. But if you have a pain point, if you have something where you're actually, you know, losing money or losing time or, or just wasting resources because of friction or inefficient processes, uh, you know, when you press on that point, they realize, oh, oh yeah, yeah, this is, it's like a doctor. Does it hurt when I do this? No, does it hurt when I do this? <laughs> yeah. Ah, okay, so that's the problem. Yes. And yeah. uh, I, I, think, I think this is, this is where I, I, I still benefit quite a bit from actually having uh, you know, a pure business master <laughs> in, terms mm -hmm. of, in terms of theoretical education. Um, because I still can can understand business processes quite well, and I've spent my time in marketing. I've spent my time in in uh, logistics and product development, and so on. Uh, so there's a lot of things that you can still relate to. Conversely, if you're a a you know pure IT guy, a coder, you have to you have to learn that. You mm -hmm. have to learn that on the job with the other people. Right which can be a great experience, mm -hmm. um, but it's a lot easier when you're an employee of the company. Right. Because you have that, well, first of all, you have much more social interaction. I mean, there's, there's, a, little more, there's a little more grace towards you. When you come in as a yes. consultant, oh, yeah. they expect you to get the job done. Very important word there, expect. The level of expectation is completely different. Yeah. So uh, that's, and that's another thing that, that I could say to, to young people coming out of university, talk to the people around you, mm -hmm. not just to the ones in your department or in your business unit or so on, mm -hmm. talk to the other ones, because wherever you are, you're, you're, part, of, you're part of an ecosystem mm -hmm. and the different bits and pieces, they influence each other. And um, Trust me, if somewhere a little gear is running, you know, slow or um, it's grinding a little bit, it will impact you. Mm -hmm. And if you're that gear, well, not you personally, but the department you're in, this mm -hmm. will impact others. And if you understand that and you understand the why and how it's impacting them, then you probably will also understand quite a bit better and quite faster why, for example, certain departments have a... Uh, let's say suboptimal um, appreciation coming from other departments <laughs> to, to, to be politically correct. <laughs> Not to say, oh God, those guys again. No, no, no. <laughs> 
I mean, we've we've all been there. We've we've all seen the situations where you're like, what's going on here? Oh, we're this department. Oh, got it. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're yeah. those guys this time. I understand now. <laughs> Yeah, and we all love to be those guys. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> we want to be those guys. No, we don't. <laughs> you, you, I tell university students, be the resource that solves problems. Yes, but, and this is something that a friend of mine always, he basically hits me over the head with this about, about twice a month or so. Um, you know, in consulting, you got, you got the, the small boutique shops and you got the big ones. Mm -hmm. And um, not to make too fine a point, but we all know that the big ones make their money with just delivering what the client asks for so that they can keep delivering later on with delivering what's actually needed, right? what the client initially asked for, because those are two completely different things. Those are the worlds in between. Mm -hmm. And basically, most of the boutique shops, they're um, geared towards solving problems. Right. Not working through list, one, to, one through ten, solving the problem. Yeah, Which obviously I, means, if you solve the problem, mm -hmm. the job is done. Yes. Uh, but when they encounter another problem, who are they going to call? Ghostbusters. Oh yeah, that's right. Ghostbusters. Where are you gonna call? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hey. For the young people looking at this, this was a very good movie from the eighties, and there was a quote from that movie. Yes, yes. <laughs> For it, yeah, it was a, it was one of those excellent movies. It's a classic. Uh, you know, read the book, the illustrated book. You know, see if you can find a first edition. <laughs> it, it, it ranks um, right up there with uh, Charles Dickens, War and Peace, and all of those other ones. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> a bit more explicit and a bit less verbose than War and Peace. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and if you hit somebody with that book, he will not be dead. Whereas with War and Peace, he will be dead. Oh yes. Oh yes. It's like uh, yeah. Christian, thank you so much. It was my pleasure, Rob. It was really nice uh, doing this. Yeah. I wasn't really sure what to expect, but um, <laughs> it was fun. It was Man. fun, and I am out of coffee. That's, that's the thing. That's the thing. I'm, I'm three months now. Yeah, it's, it's, it's three months and two days of, of basically being inside, doing everything over Zoom and Teams and, and many things even just over email, where literally you get something and you do it and you send it back and you, and you get email. Oh, thanks. Mm -hmm. We're humans. Three months we and two we days. need interaction. We need interaction. Yeah, the, yeah the, 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 I came back on the 13th of March. <laughs> Okay, Christian, I love you, but the way I measure it is not three months and two days, which the 13th was of March was the, the day it hit me too. The way I measure it is just too long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's no, it, it definitely has been too long. It definitely has been too long. But I can tell you're in Switzerland. You have to be absolutely precise. <laughs> I have my Swiss watch and I know it is precise. <laughs> <laughs> I have my German motorcycle and my German car and they are precise. Exactly. <laughs> That's how things should be. And I have my Latin at attitude, which is like, yeah, I'll get there when, you know. <laughs> You see, that's the thing. I'm actually living in one of the Latin parts of Switzerland, so I'm kind of the weird person because I'm always on time. There's a Latin part of a Switzerland? There's actually two Latin parts. I'm in the French part, and then uh, there's an Italian part. Okay. All right. I, I just kind of pictured, you know, that I've only been to Switzerland twice, and that was both times connecting in Zurich. Yes, German part. So very, 
Yes. <laughs> I am yeah. going to have to make time, come to Switzerland, bring my skis so we can go to Austria so we can afford to ski. <laughs> Not that far, that's okay. <laughs> this Christian. is actually, no, this where, here. The, where is the, yeah, here. This is actually the uh, hotel, a really, really great hotel where you can stay. And the ski lift is literally like 50 meters away. So you can walk to the ski lift and just drive up and so on. Let's plan on it. Yeah, we should do that once. That would actually be fun. Let it, we can do a, uh, a conference. We can set up a conference there. <laughs> No, a casual no conference. conference. Yeah, yeah, but the, you know how hard that would be to do the conference. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because everyone will be skiing. Well, or in the spa. Or in the spa, yes, yes. <laughs> That's the thing. You would basically have to say, we meet, you know, for one hour after breakfast or so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you can do whatever you want. <sighs> Good idea. I like that idea. <laughs> and, and, you know, it can be a casual conference, you know, it's just, you know, send out an email blast. We're all meeting at this little uh, place. Yeah. You know, uh, Camille will show up and pass out beers. Yes. Uh, of course, of course you will. Of course you will. I'm, uh, I'm sure we would find one to 20 people who would be very interested in joining. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, I'm going to let you go. Mahalo. See, that's not Latin. That's Hawaiian, which is yes. a little more relaxed than Latin. There's, there's no surfing in the Mediterranean. Well, or, or is there? I think, I think they do now, but there, it's not really Latin, you know. But. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, Rob. It was really nice talking to you. All right, let's chat again. Thanks so much. All right, bye. Take care. Bye, Rob.